Well, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here. We so appreciate all of you. We want to be together and we will be together. Uh, we're going to do a big party sometime, sometime. So, um, so we're going to be showing a two hour film that Pat and I spent um, wow. several months creating um, with our editor, Adam Titone, who's not here today, but oh man, we put him through it. So we really, really, really appreciate him. Um, and obviously it's been really challenging, but it's also been really rewarding. And we acknowledged just like this week that this is a huge part of our grieving process to have this finished and to be showing it end. So thanks for being here with us for that. Um, we really hope that, that the film that we made um, justifies Chucky's amazing life. Um, we've had a lot of fun, so we hope that's, it's really enjoyable for everybody. And you'll pick that up, the fun part. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and after an hour, we're going to take a 10 minute break because it's pretty long. And, um, and to keep the film to two hours, we had to edit down many contributions. So if you were one of those people, no, it was difficult to do. And we didn't want to, but it was necessary. We kept getting in trouble from our filmmaker. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. okay, so uh, we also just wanted to say that if you partake, we encourage day drinking during this <laughs> filming. <laughs> Here you go, Marcia. <laughs> yes. Here's to Chuck. Hello, everyone. If you don't know me, I am Pat Lund, Chuck Yingling's wife of 42 years. Our family has waited a whole year to celebrate Chuck's life partly because we've been in shock and sad, and partly to give ourselves time to create a memorial that does justice to this often bigger than life man. First, there will be this pre-recorded documentary length recording that by the way, you'll be able to watch it anytime later. This will include the early parts of Chuck's life, his professional legacy, a taste of his me amazing varied life interests, beautiful stories from family and friends, and some final reflections. Throughout, music that Chuck loved will be playing. Hours before he died, he dictated a list of his most treasured music. We will then open the Zoom mic for anyone who has things to add to this story and tribute. At Noah's memorial last year, we learned so many things about him that we didn't know. Perhaps this will happen now as well. I'm going to start at the end of Chuck's life because as you'll see, how Chuck left this world provides a fitting platform for the broad and beautiful story of his life. Chuck basically had two days to know that his body was no longer a viable container for life. So what did he do? He didn't sleep from Friday evening until he finished his task of communicating with his treasured family and friends on Sunday afternoon. Even though his physical heart was severely damaged, his brain was working perfectly. During that time, he organized specific messages that he wanted to share with each of us. For example, with me, he spoke for about 40 minutes going over our time together, year by year, epic by epic. He asked that I not interrupt, but just listen. It was amazing. And of great import was the fact that he didn't seem to be sad or upset. Now, let me tell you, he had practiced at that. For the previous year, he had an app on his phone that texted him five times every day that said, don't forget you are going to die. We would be eating dinner, the ding would go off on his phone, and if we asked who texted you, we would hear the answer, oh, I'm going to die. It became a joke as we all recited this fact in mass. This in fact was a Buddhist oriented practice a reminder to appreciate each moment of life to its fullest. We've been students of Buddhist practices for many years centered around such acknowledgement. This photo 
taken by Chuck's 18-year-old granddaughter, Gita, minutes before he signaled the nurse to turn off the pump that was keeping him alive. As you can tell, he appeared peaceful and accepting, ready for the next chapter. He told us that he loved to go on journeys and was curious about this next one. We were all moved by the grace and acceptance that he showed us. Chuck entered the world on September 2nd, 1942. His father had died suddenly the previous May, so he was raised by his courageous mother, Ora. She had also lived through the sudden death of her first husband 12 years earlier, leaving her with two small sons. They were 14 and 16 when she married Chuck's father, who was also Charles Dale Yingling. Chuck's brother, Jimmy, died on Iwo Jima at age 19. He played in the Marine Band and died serving as a paramedic in World War II. His other brother, Bobby, also known as Holly, became a newspaper editor for the Dallas Times. He served as a political correspondent in Washington, D.C. and was confidant to politicians, notably Lyndon Johnson. He and Chuck became very close over the years, sharing many interests and many stories. Both Chuck and his brothers were talented musicians, even forming a jazz band during their high school years when Chuck was a little boy. <clears throat> the following very early sweet memories are from Chuck's then known as Dale, cousin Janice. I am Dale's first cousin and he was nine months older than I am. Therefore, we were the right age to grow up as playmates. As we were growing up as young kids, we fussed and we argued a lot. Dale was born with an extreme intelligence and was born with a sense of curiosity of what makes the world work and what everything in the world, how does it work? At age three, he went to Colorado for the summer with his grandmother, Yinglin. And when he came back home, he could read. And I remember shortly after him coming back home, him starting to read me the Sunday comics as we lay in the floor at Aunt Dora's house after we had been to church while she was fixing lunch. So he was almost seven before he started first grade. We ended up in the first grade class together. The teacher put him on the front seat on the far side of the room at the last row and put me in the back seat the last row because the two of us get together too often. As we grew up together, he invented many things for us to do and some of them got us in trouble. There are many other escapades that, that I could tell you about. but. Um, I can remember my, my little brother, who's two years older than I am, two years younger than I am, which meant about four years between uh, him and Dale, being in total awe. He went over to Aunt Oris one day, and, and she had a long screen back porch. And Dale had just made a radio uh, for different pieces, and, and so John was in awe of, of Dale. So he had a very interesting younger life. In high school... Uh, he finally found a couple of buddies that went along and really were into the same things he was into. And he and one of them, quite often the chemistry teacher let them stay after school and work in the chemistry lab doing experiments. One time their experiment exploded. Uh, did a little damage to the chem, chem lab, but at least it did not burn the high school down. I have enjoyed Dale, being with Dale as growing up and not seen much of him in my adult years, but I dearly love that man. Thank you, bye-bye. Of course, in school, Chuck didn't do anything, just following the normal course. When he started school, he immediately skipped two grades, as his schoolmate, Nancy Harkrider, tells us. I am Nancy Harkrider, and Dale Yingling popped into my life when we sat together in first grade in Mount Pleasant a very small town in East Texas. 
Dale was fond of pointing out that not only was there no mountain in our town, but that it certainly wasn't very pleasant. He was a character, but so was I, and we did get along so very well. He later helped me with my algebra, and I helped him find a date for the prom. Well, the years went by after we left public school, but when we got together again, it really was a blast. When I next encountered him at a school reunion, I really couldn't believe how much he had changed physically, but there he was underneath, giving everybody a hard time and being outrageous. I'd be willing to bet that his poor teachers were at their wit's end, trying to keep this brainy little boy entertained. He spent a fair amount of time sitting in the principal's office, sometimes waiting for his mother to arrive for a conference, but usually reading. He and his best friend Dickie would rush through their schoolwork in order to grab the next Encyclopedia Britannica, which they both apparently read from start to finish. Chuck's high school years, I'm sure, were filled with figuring out how to meet girls. He had the good fortune to be taught by an outstanding choir master, and during those years, his beautiful bass baritone voice was trained to perfection. He was introduced to a wide-ranging repertoire of classical music. I'm so sorry we didn't record him singing very often. But then again, we all enjoyed his gift in each moment. Later on in this documentary, we'll play a recording of his beautiful voice. Chuck had an uncanny ability to follow and develop his interests to an amazing degree. An example, he was interested in Morse code. He became a licensed ham operator as soon as allowed, 12 years old, I believe. He built his own machinery, even a 200 foot tower in his backyard. He would stay up through many a night communicating with other ham operators on the other side of the world. This is when he took on the name Chuck. A ham in Australia was unable to understand the soft name Dale, so renamed him Chuck, which was much easier to understand on the crackly thousands of miles connections. Being raised by a single mom in the 1950s South, money was difficult to come by, so he would save his allowance to buy precious audio radio magazines and to upgrade his equipment. At age 14, he organized an international conference, actually, I think it was a national conference, on a topic which he knew more about than anyone, which was attended by many top ham operators from all over the states. Somehow, it didn't occur to him to be shy about his opening speech, nor about teaching what he knew to a room full of grown-ups. Sound familiar? Chuck didn't share much about his high school years, though I know he received scholarships and much support to attend math and physics camps. He was a National Merit Scholar and had a full scholarship to Rice University. Rice, it ends up, wasn't the right school for this buddied Renaissance young man. All math and science? Mm -mm. Chuck spent much of his time at the piano in his college. He taught himself Beethoven and Bach. He played a lot of tennis, and he was very active in the theater, which wasn't taught in this scientifically oriented university. He made many dear friends during his time there, and we used to visit them throughout the years. He also met his wife-to-be Wendy at Rice. Chuck went off to New York City to work in the theater off-Broadway. Wendy completed her undergraduate degree. He was there for six years before returning to Rice to complete his undergraduate and Ph. degrees in biology. In his off-Broadway work, Chuck was the only member of the team who was not afraid to climb the multi-story ladders they would jerry-rig together. The team would sometimes work for three days straight preparing shows with little time for food or sleep during that time. This sounds like practice for the many years in the operating room at the UCSF. One time he was visiting old friends in San Francisco when he was on a work trip and the eight month pregnant wife offered to give him a tour of the city if 
he knew how to ride a motorcycle, which of course he did. This, this wonderful cartoon is by granddaughter Gita. It was then that he decided that someday he would live in San Francisco. It took him 10 years to get here with a job and the rest is history. A story significant to Chuck and his first wife, Wendy, took place in the late 1960s. Returning to Brooklyn Heights from a weekend getaway in their black TR4, they happened to walk by a pet store, which had a new primate in the window, a baby spider monkey. They walked in and the observant owner placed the sweet, soft, large-eyed monkey directly into Wendy's open arms. Two hours later, Chuck was in the pet store buying the first of their monkey clan. Her name was Barushka, and she and two other of her species later joined into the family, Eloise and Spidel. Chuck became an authority on monkeys, and his interest led him to pursue a graduate degree in biology. It was time to head to Rice for graduate school. Chuck built a traveling cage, and pulled by the beloved sports car, off they went to Houston, attracting crowds whenever they stopped at a southern campground. Upon opening the door of the cage at night, the monkeys would head for the trees. Very quickly, Chuck and Wendy had learned not to feed the brood when they stopped. So after the cage was cleaned, a banana held up in the air brought them all home to dinner. Other species eventually joined the family, a genin, capuchin, and squirrel monkey. Chuck had many stories as well as scars from the monkey bites. Each of his children and grandchildren learned to gauge their weight in relation to his sack of monkey chow. 50 pounds was a significant milestone, and especially if you know that they had to carry the food into their fourth floor walk up in Manhattan. I think it's fair to say that a very deep part of Chuck's psyche was born with the addition of the monkeys in his life. And this sound often rang into the house. Jumping ahead a bit, this photograph is of Chuck in 1974. He was invited to Brussels to present his dissertation results at an international conference. And that's his soon-to-be boss, Notch Calloway, inviting him to come to San Francisco for a postdoc, which he did in 1975. Toward the end of Chuck's postdoc, he showed up on another old motorcycle to our lab at the old U.S. Public Health Hospital. There we all worked day and night to produce a multi-million dollar grant to study dyslexia. We called it the Great Dyslexia Project, and with co-PI David Gallen, we finished that grant, which Janine Heron will tell you about. I'm Janine Heron. There was a team of us, a merry little band, Bob Ornstein, David Gallen, Jack Johnstone, Pat Lund, Chuck, so many of us. But we had the building all to ourselves and we made the best. We didn't have to be in the atmosphere of those sober professional psychiatrists at Langley Porter. So we were definitely an independent bunch for a period of time during the late 70s and early 80s. And um, we worked hard. We did good research. We did good EEG and, and evoke potential and behavioral research with dyslexic kids and their controls. But we had a good time too. We would have lunches with Bree and Crackers out in the sun on the front steps. We would join into the bathroom. We'd all gather in the bathroom and sing because the bathroom had great acoustics and Chuck and David and Pat, we all had good voices and we just enjoyed singing and it sounded so good in that bathroom. We did together as a team while we were there. We had expeditions down to Baker Beach and had lunch on the beach and walked up and down in the sand and looked at our beautiful 
Bay and Bridge. It was uh, it was an idyllic time, and we thought we were doing important work, and it felt good to be together doing that work. Um, one time, Chuck had been the main author on one on a grant, in fact, two grants. And he put a lot of work into it. And when the <clears throat> critique came back, one of the questions was, well, if you get both grants, what are you going to do with the money? And of course, I expected that Chuck would provide a very professional and serious reply saying how we would spend that budget, how we would spend that money. And he wrote back and he said, we'll have a hell of a good party. <laughs> and, and they liked it. They, uh, it really added to the grant in the way that they realized we were a good team and we were going to work well together. So I couldn't have done what I have done in my life without Chuck Yangling. Hi, I'm Deborah Rennie. In the 1970s, I worked with Chuck at Langley Porter Institute. And um, when Chuck came as a, a new colleague, I was taking him around and introducing him to people. And at the time, Chuck was uh, doing some brainwave studies on a subject that was called cortical coupling. So when I was, went to introduce him to um, a colleague named Rick, who became a very dear friend, um, I said, Rick, I'd like you to meet Chuck Yingling and he's studying cortical coupling. And to that, Rick said, oh, I think from now on, I'm gonna call you cortical chuckling. And he did. At the end of the Great Dyslexia Project, Chuck began the unpleasant task of writing a new grant, which was due on Monday morning. On the Friday afternoon before a noted neurosurgeon, Yoshio Hachibuchi, asked Chuck if he thought he could figure out a way to monitor brain function during a neurosurgical procedure, and get this, on the following Monday morning. Chuck came home to discuss and think through whether to let go of the completed, almost completed grant proposal in order to build a machine to monitor electrical activity in the brain during surgery. Of course, he came up with a design and constructed an interoperative monitoring device. He likely didn't tell many people this story, but he went to the auto parts store and purchased two car batteries. Then he dug around in storage closets all over the hospital for a cart, adding his EEG equipment to record brain activity. A successful surgery took place at 8 a.m. on Monday morning and thus the beginning of his new career in the field of neurosurgery. His former colleague, Sabrina Galloway, wrote a lovely tribute to Chuck. Hi, I'm Sabrina Galloway, and I had known Chuck for well over 25 years um, in three different capacities. First of all, as an interoperative neuromonitoring professional. Secondly, as a friend, as we became friends over the years, we had a lot of oysters together. And thirdly, um, as a business colleague in Golden Gate Neuromonitoring. I cannot be with you today because I am out of the country, but I'd like to share with you an article that I wrote in memory of Chuck that was published in the Agent Journal, uh, which is the American Journal of Electro-Neurodiagnostic Technologists. Thank you. Um, Chuck was a leading pioneer in the field of interoperative neuromonitoring. His achievements and accomplishments are vast, yet he always found time to give back to every individual by answering phone calls for any IOM or EEG professional needing guidance on an IOM technique. He delivered invited platform presentations, he published research articles, and served as a peer reviewer for a number of professional journals. His passion was to expand the field and share his knowledge base to better care for patients. Chuck always made a point of meeting with patients before their surgery, explaining that I'm your electrician and teaching them about how he would contribute to the safety of their procedure. Chuck's lovely bass bar baritone voice could be heard loudly in an OR suite when the surgeon needed an instant notification of a change in the electrical signals of the patient's brain and or spinal cord. 
Over the years, Chuck amassed a great library, library filled with books from sports to religion, to many fields of science, to history, to travel, to music and theater, and more. He always told me that good readers are good writers, and he would then promptly send me an article to read. He published numerous journal articles and book chapters on many topics in neuromonitoring, most notably authoring articles on cranial nerve monitoring during skull base surgery, transcranial motor evoke potentials, cortical spinal tract mapping and monitoring, and selective dorsal rhizotomy. If I had to count, Chuck personally probably monitored well over 4,000 surgical cases in the operating room keeping patients successfully safe from iatrogenic injury. It was not unusual to find Chuck crawling around on an OR floor, troubleshooting or coming up with new ways, ways to solve IOM problems. With that cur curious mind, he developed the Yingling Flex Tip Monopolar Stimulator Probe, a pliable probe for investigating those tight places where nerves are hiding during craniotomies still in use today. Chuck was interested in lifting up those around him, up to being better surgical neurophysiologist, up to being outstanding neurodiagnostic technologist, and up to being better persons. He challenged a mundane thought and played the devil's advocate in most situations where he feared complacency was the sense of the day. This perhaps made him intimidating at times and controversial at others. But at the end of the day, however, Chuck's goal was to make an impact on the advanced delivery of interoperative neuromonitoring. This he accomplished. In closing, I hope everyone has a Chuck story. He touched so many lives throughout his career and his knowledge, with his knowledge, his big personality, his thoughtfulness, and his gift of curiosity. I have a smile on my face as I remember his multiple stories told in that wonderful case. And his other neurosurgery colleagues, Dr. Phil Weinstein and Dr. Larry Pitts have this to say about Chuck. Thanks very much to Pat and Shannon for inviting me to participate in Chuck's memorial. He was a great friend, a brilliant colleague and a true Renaissance man. I will always miss him and so very much regret and truly resent his untimely passing. I first met Chuck in the UCSF operating room where he eventually spent a good bit of his life, both day and night, providing functional monitoring for neurosurgical patients. As a physiological psychologist, he understood and continuously tested the activity of nerves, spinal cord, and brain. This he did during operations removing tumors, stopping seizures, and correcting spinal deformities. His goal was to prevent occurrence of numbness, paralysis, blindness, or deafness. Chuck was a genius as an electrician, a guide as an anatomist, and a pioneer as inventor and teacher of neuromonitoring technology. So I want to enumerate Chuck's prodigious scientific publications, local, national, and international leadership recognition, and legions of superlative appreciative testimonials from surgeons, anesthesiologists, and patients from almost every hospital in, this, in the Bay Area. I would prefer to reminisce a bit about the joy of walking into the OR myself and seeing Chuck's hidden smile behind the surgical screen shining through his mask. He liked to teach with diagrams of electrical circuits and anatomical connections traced on his scrubs with a magic marker. One of Chuck's favorite philosophical questions about significance of an observed monitoring change was, is it a difference that makes a difference? He was a gentle mentor and often said about a mistake made, don't worry, there's already enough blame to go around. Chuck would say that he was busier than a baby with a bunny while serving as troubleshooter and consultant for six to eight monitored OR cases simultaneously on a typical day. He often carried a secret unsterile soldering iron hidden in his scrubs. In between cases, he did creative research to establish new techniques for protecting or repairing the tiny nerves going to and from the face, ears, eyes, and hands from surgical injury. 
Outside the OR, we shared a love of classical Indian music and both separately studied tabla at the Ali Akbar Khan School of Music in Berkeley. Our family nicknames were Philateta and Gilateta. With Pat, we traveled to Paris to tour the Seine and its tributaries in search of an adorable old Dutch coal barge converted to riverboat that was ultimately taken off the market by its wistful owners. Back at home, I will never forget the day when Chuck dashed down to the car for his toolbox and heroically released a jammed relay in our electric skylight after rain started during lunch with Pat and Jill on our roof deck. So many are the treasured memories of glorious sailing days with Chuck on San Francisco Bay on Hinana and sipping champagne on Valentine's Day with our beloveds aboard his second home antique powerboat, Annalena, over in Sausalito. And he never forgot to send a birthday gift. Thanks, Chuck. You set the standards for affection, integrity, adventure, and joie de vivre. Farewell, my dear friend. We'll see you down the road. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Larry Pitts, a retired neurosurgeon from UCSF, uh, and uh, pleased to be part of this remarkable memorial service for Chuck Yingling. Uh, my first encounters with Chuck uh, were reasonably early in my faculty time at UCSF involving uh, intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring. Uh, the kind of cases that I was doing were small tumors uh, at the base of the brain surrounded by a ton of critical small nerves that we couldn't easily see uh, but needed to protect and so uh, Chuck got involved with us to uh, electrically find these small structures and uh, carefully protect them while we took tumors out. Uh, Chuck jumped, jumped into the uh, whole exercise with his usual undying enthusiasm, um, his inventiveness in taking on a new area and really making it succeed. Uh, he devoted many long hours. These were slow cases in the operating room, uh, done uh, uh, very carefully, as you can imagine. And Chuck spent hours and hours and hours with us there uh, as an essential part of the team. Uh, I think our families uh, bore some of the brunt of uh, all the time we spent uh, away from home in the operating room. And so I'm grateful to, to my wife, uh, uh, who passed away uh, two years ago, and uh, to uh, Pat and her family for their support of uh, us while we did the work that we did. Um, Chuck uh, devised a number of new stimulation and uh, monitoring techniques, uh, uh, worked with us watching under the microscope to see how we were doing, to see how he could improve uh, the ease with which we carried on what we were doing. Uh, Chuck not only worked uh, on individual cases uh, and gathering information, but he pulled all these data together and uh, was really uh, uh, widely published, uh, brought a number of techniques into common knowledge among monitoring people around the world where this uh, specialty was just starting to grow. Uh, he was a renowned uh, teacher, uh, and much sought after lecture, and this continued throughout his entire life. Um, the uh, a dream that Chuck had uh, that hasn't been realized. He hoped uh, that we could start uh, an academic uh, training program in neuromonitoring, uh, eventually an electrophysiology PhD. Uh, I think that's still a really worthwhile thing to do because this uh, field needs to be uh, made as uh, careful and scientific as it can be for uh, patients around the world. Uh, I didn't really know or understand uh, a lot of uh, the things that Chuck did, uh, his many talents. Uh, for instance, he uh, was an accomplished musician. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Phil Weinstein, uh, knew a lot more about uh, this than I did. Uh, I did know that Chuck was an avid sailor. I sailed with him a number of times, and we had a great time on uh, San Francisco Bay. And Chuck was also a Giants baseball fan, uh, the same as I am. Uh, I continue uh, loving to watch the Giants. Uh, some of Chuck's uh, love for the game uh, spilled over into his family, and uh, Shannon, our girls, and I occasionally go to a ball game together. Uh, Chuck was a man of many talents. He was funny, uh, intense at times, 
He loved his family and his friends. He was such a wonderful person uh, and, and a friend, and I'll uh, miss his sunny disposition. Uh, his memory lives on. Thanks. Chuck was my teacher, my friend, my peace of mind in all these years since I immigrated to the United States. He was the most generous, the most thoughtful person I knew. And there was only three person in my more than 30 years medical career. I can tell, I can call them as my teachers and at the same time friends. I miss him every day. Almost every surgery I'm working, I would say, to me, what Chuck will be said about this modality, what Chuck will suggest to do better. Oh, I can see those changes, can I discuss it with Chuck? And then there's a horrible feeling, he's not here anymore. I want to say that we're going to remember him uh, in my life, in my family life forever. and. I want to say all this paper he wrote influenced me to me significantly. Um, emotionally, he was the most cheerful person with his deep, beautiful voice. Um, every time he will talk with the most difficult anesthesiologists coming to their places. Oh, what are you doing? How are you hiding? What are you hiding here? Uh, let me see. He. He was fun to work with. He was one of the best teachers. We do, I do, remember him and miss him so much. My name is Olga Belakina. I am a neurologist from Ukraine who work here in the United States as a neurophysiologist. Chuck, I miss you. We had so many stories to share about the many interests that our guy pursued. Sailing, golf, world travel, hiking in the mountains, wine and scotch, Buddhist studies, massive, massive reading, being a minister, fathering and grandfathering, being open to sharing his life in our home with many and more. Sailing. In 1975, when Chuck got to San Francisco, he took sailing lessons in Sausalito. On a very first class, a freak wind in San Francisco Bay blew the small sailboat over, catching the instructor in the lines and breaking the mast. Ever the fast thinker, Chuck cut the lines, retrieving the nearly drowning instructor and saving the day. Chuck's fast thinking and action have become history for that school. And when Noah took sailing lessons with them many years later, he learned that his father was a hero. In 1976, for the 200 year anniversary of America, Chuck rented a small, a very small sailboat and took his mother and girlfriend out underneath the huge naval ships coming into the bay. This cartoon is by our friend Dave. Sailing became a significant part of Chuck's life. He took a number of blue water sailing trips to Wallace and Fortuna, where's that? Samoa, Easter Island, Pitcairn Island, the Marquesas, Spitsbergen. On a trip to the North Pole, Chuck was at the helm early one morning. It ended up that outdated maps due to climate change led him to hit a submerged rock in the Arctic Ocean, causing a man overboard among the icebergs. After fi fishing out the cold sailor and strenuously working to release the boat, the crew had to wait for the tide to turn before the sailboat would be released many hours later. After which, they sailed north to the polar ice cap, more than 600 miles from the North Pole, actually less than 600 miles on a 46-foot sloop. 
He and Noah sailed around Ireland to Scotland. On that trip around the west coast of Ireland, they visited and cavorted with the natives in small coastal towns, reachable only by boat. I kind of got the idea that they had a pretty wild time, especially Noah, who joined in to a late night, rather drunken bachelorette party at one stop. In the Caribbean, Chuck signed on his crew on a tall ship to stop Amsterdam with more than 300 sails to manage and Heineken beer on tap on the deck. Many more such trips were on his bucket list. Around the year 2000, Chuck began buying boats, which were used as office and weekend home in Sausalito. A 30-foot Baba sailboat and two power boats later, we still have a lovely old 49-foot classic wooden boat in Pelican Harbor in Sausalito. Chuck had an extensive computer set up and used Annalena as an office monitoring complex neurosurgery cases. He also met with attorneys for cases in which he served as legal consultant when there was an unfortunate surgical outcome. Many an attorney scheduled their consultations in Sausalito rather than meeting online or even in San Francisco. Chuck also had an excellent piano set up on the aft of the boat with an unobstructed view out to Mount Tamalpais in Marin County. Many people walked by and had long chats with him as he enjoyed the view and the sunshine. His musical creativity was fed by the beauty that was surrounding him. This is him talking to our friend, Matt Heron, who had recently died, and he was learning a new song for Matt. Hey, Matt. I'm so impressed by how you learned to play the bass uh, that I have decided I'm gonna devote some of that same kind of energy to trying to learn to play the piano. And so I'm trying to learn how to play Fiddler's Green for you. And when I get there, we will we will give it a try. Etc. I'll uh, get back to you when I get it done. Chuck took up golf at the age of 51, and he loved playing with the UCSF Golf Club. He called it flog and mostly enjoyed playing with our son, Noah. They even won a father-son golf tournament played in the Berkeley Hills. Here is his friend, Red Mike. This is a letter from Red Mike, a gentleman who is both friends with Noah and Chuck. I really enjoyed playing golf with Noah and Chuck. They were both ridiculous on the course in their own maddening way, but I imagine that's no real surprise to any of you. We ended up playing on a lot of Tuesday quote-unquote mornings, which means we teed off at about 11 or so. That was fairly early in the day for Noah and I. But on Tuesdays at noon in the city, it would do its siren test, and we'd all look at one another from wherever we were on the course and throw our arms up. The only place to be on a Tuesday at noon there's a siren here in D.C. that tests on Saturdays at noon. Makes me think of those fools every time. Chuck was also a dedicated student of Buddhism, studying, meditating, and attending retreats at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, Tassajara Mountain Center, Green Gulch Farm, San Francisco Zen Center, as well as going to end-of-life retreats with the Meta Institute. As most of you know, Chuck was constantly studying and playing many different musical instruments, tabla, flutes, both wooden and silver, cello, piano. And of course, his tastes in music were wide-ranging, including jazz, classical from many different traditions, rock and roll, especially the Grateful Dead, Indian classical music, you name it. He studied tabla with masters Ala Raka and Zakir Hussein and gave learning the cello a good try. Flute and piano playing came naturally to him, plus, of course, his voice. 
Here's a beautiful tribute to Chuck, given on Tangents Radio 91.7 by Dory Stein, including a repeat of Chuck singing in a Greek hammam. And Chuck Yingling passed away, who anyone who knew Chuck was touched. He was the rare person who had such a sweet aura about him, was insanely intelligent, and was not just a scientist, but was a beautiful singer. a serious lover of especially French wines. He and I belonged to a serious wine tasting group in San Francisco for many years. One year he took money out of his retirement to purchase Bordeaux wine futures, those of 1986 and 1989. The bottles are still in our sub-basement of our home, awaiting being drunk. Another love of Chuck's was the Sierra Nevada mountains. For more than 30 years, our family spent lovely weeks in a cabin at 10,000 feet. Here's a photo of Chuck at Rock Creeks Valley. More than once, unfortunately, Chuck would head out alone, getting ever so slightly lost, but eventually making it back, obviously. Here is his eldest child, Arden, telling of her dad with her in the mountains. I'm Arden, Chuck's oldest daughter, and I have one more story I'd like to tell about Chuck. Chuck introduced me to the Sierra Nevada mountains when I was a kid, and I fell hopelessly in love. But I'm also really scared of heights. So things got interesting when Chuck and I decided to climb a mountain the summer I was nine years old. We picked Mount Dana, which is 13,000 feet high. And it's more of a big hike than an actual climb, but the trail is really long and steep and tiring. Still, I was happy until we got to the final section. With the summit in clear view, all my fear of heights took over. And I sat down in a pile of boulders and I sobbed and I told Chuck I was too scared to keep going. He tried to convince me that I would not move. After a long time, he said, okay, we got really close, we'll hike back down now. Right at that moment, a group of hikers came down from the summit and they told us how amazing the view was and they said, keep going, you're so close, you can do it. I realized I really wanted to climb that mountain and I told Chuck I'd changed my mind. We scrambled up more boulders and made it to the summit and it really was amazing. Chuck told that story many times in the years after, and he always emphasized the hikers. 
He said they must have been angels come to help us out. Maybe, but I don't think Chuck gave himself enough credit. I know he was frustrated when I refused to keep going, but he was also patient. He respected that I felt like I couldn't do it. And when I found my courage, he helped me stand up and he cheered me on. Chuck went on to take my siblings, Noah and Shannon, to the top of Mount Dana as well. They went when they were about nine too and they wore the same pair of hiking boots I did. I know all three of those climbs meant a lot to Chuck, but I'm not sure he ever knew how much it meant to me. Climbing Mount Dana was the first time in my life I realized that I'm strong and that I can be afraid and keep going. And knowing that has meant so much to me. The angel hikers are part of this story, but the most important part is that Chuck gave me space to find my own strength. That hike could have been a really bad memory, and instead it's one of my favorites. I owe that to Chuck, and I will always be grateful. Thank you. As many of you know, Chuck loved to travel, covering much of this earth we inhabit. He made it to much of Europe, I won't list all of that, but Paris 14 times, Egypt, Israel, Kashmir, India, Nepal, Thailand, China, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Jamaica, the Turks and Caicos, Pitcairn Island, many stops from sea voyages in England, Scotland, Ireland, even Norway. I was always impressed at how he would study the culture and customs of places he was going to visit. For example, for a special trip to Japan, he had professional cards printed, one side in English, the other side in Japanese, which he would formally present to his hosts. They were very impressed. He also learned and thrilled his, his hosts by loudly slurp slurping his soup, the sign of deep appreciation of the flavors. Pretty special. Another skill quality that Chuck had that many of you probably don't know about is this. Many years ago, a friend asked Chuck if he would marry them. So with a good Rolling Stone magazine memory, he signed up with the Universal Life Church and became a certified minister in California. Over time, he married probably 10 couples, even including an interesting ceremony. I think it was from South America somewhere. The couple and all the guests dressed completely in white walked into the cold Pacific Ocean for the ceremony. He took the job seriously, spending time to get to know the couple and often including a Jungian inspired study of various parts of each person. Chuck's ability to discern the inner parts of people could manifest an embarrassing revelation to the wedding guests. He married our son, in Shakespeare Garden in Golden Gate Park. And dressed as a Benedictine monk, he married dear friends in a castle in the south of France. Later on, he spent $50 and became a bishop in the church. Hey there, I just wanted to introduce this very important section um, about Chuck as a grandfather. And Chuck used to say that he thought maybe he was an even better grandfather than he was father because he took that job very seriously. And as we've been putting this documentary together, we're um, realizing that the section on Chuck as a grandfather is the longest section that we have with the most images. It's, and it's true. Um, so here it is. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm Gita Yaling. I'm Chuck's eldest granddaughter. Everyone always said that my grandpa and I had a really special connection, which is a sentiment I share to the fullest. Grandpa Chuck and I had an alikeness where it felt like we really got each other, despite all of our many differences. He always felt like kind of a, a safe haven, a safe person, a lighthouse of love, if you will, because I was in Texas and he was in California. I know that sounds cheesy, but it feels appropriate. He was such a cheerleader for me. He was always constantly encouraging my passions. I've always loved art, and he loved championing that passion and showing off my work to everyone. I remember countless hours spent on his boat in Sausalito, 
doodling and chatting. We love to visit museums together, especially around the San Francisco area, like the De Young. We would often text about an artist we found or a technique we ran across, just having a good time talking about art together. In fact, one of the last conversations I really had with him was about an artist he loved, Oscar Okuno, who made hyper-realistic ballpoint pen art. The night before I flew to San Francisco to say my official goodbye to him, I spent my time drawing Pat in that same, same pen style. When I was able to give him the drawing in the hospital, he gave that classic Chuck reaction, the big signature gasp of joy. <gasps> and he wanted to show everyone that walked in the room how much he really adored it. I'll always remember that moment so fondly. As I finish off my last year of high school and head off to college, I continue to make decisions about my future with his support in mind. I plan to study conservation science and go into environmental education because nature and curiosity about the natural sciences has always been a love of mine. And it's another thing that I shared with Chuck and we bonded over. All the times Chuck took me to Cal Academy on hikes through the redwoods or by the bay, and all the conversations we had about ecology and science were such a source of encouragement for me to pursue science in my future. I'll forever be grateful for the time we spent together. Thank you for teaching me so much about life and support. May your memory be a blessing. I love you, Grandpa. Hi, I'm Chuck's granddaughter. And this is his awesome daughter. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm here to share a little story. And then I think she's going to share maybe something too. Um, so I'm just going to say it. Um, I remember a few years back, um, Chuck and I were at Matt and Janine's house, I think. Or maybe a cabin somewhere, I'm not sure. Um... But we heard that there was a canoe, and we really wanted to go canoeing. And so one day we just decided to, and we went down to the dock. I remember it was covered in fiberglass, and we had no shoes on, so that, that was, like, bad. Painful. It, <laughs> painful. I was, like, sitting in the bathtub for hours being like, my feet! Um, but that's another story. Um, and I remember Chuck and I were all getting situated, like, getting the life jackets on getting like the paddle stuff ready, you know, just ready for a lake trip for fun. Um, and I remember he told me to sit in the middle of the boat so it wouldn't tip over or something. But uh, like little five-year-old me is like, oh, sit on the side? Okay. And I sat on the side and the whole boat, and then like I think Chuck had just got on and then I was on the side and then the whole like boat tipped over and we all, we both fell in the water. And I think um, when that happened, Chuck lost his cell phone in the lake. And I'm pretty sure it's still down there, just, like, waiting to be found. So that was really funny. Yeah. Bye. Okay. <laughs> That's good enough. Corner jokes. Yeah. That's what that's what they, they wear to know that you're okay to be here, that you belong to somebody that's here and it's okay because they don't want just random people wandering in I just the in. hospital. I heard. So you're supposed to keep that on you so that when the people at the hospital see you, they know it's okay for you to be here.
But wait, wait, we don't stick it on your skin. You can stick it on your dress. There we go. Oh. There we go. Oh! I need to be covered with the You want to be covered with the Okay. Um, what, like that. Um, do you have pants on? Huh? Do you have pants on? I got chonies on. <laughs> other than that, this is what's called a hospital hey. gown. It's, There's me and Ellie. There's you and Ellie. That's right. I'm so cute with Ellie. You are. You what's guys are so little cute together. Things? This and this? Hi, I am Chuck's youngest granddaughter, and I wanted to tell you a story about the midnight snacks that he always used to make me before I would go to bed. I would usually go to bed at, I think, 9 on weekends and 8 o'clock on school nights, but I wouldn't be at their house every day. I would usually sleep at my parents' house where, you know, we lived, but um, on special occasions, usually weekends, I would stay at my grandpa and grandma's house, aka Chuck and Pat's house. Um, it was really fun because they let me stay up late and they gave me midnight snacks whenever I wanted. And usually I would just make a glass of milk and some toast, but Chuck made the most interesting snacks. He always tried to make it like a sailboat or like a smiley face or something, and it would always bring me so much joy before I go to bed. And that was something I really liked about him because he would go out of his way to make me a snack and I really appreciated that. And I really miss you, Grandpa. I love you. And he always used to say, like we always used to take our dog, Jessica, with us on the boat and like kind of tie her up on the boat so she wouldn't jump off. And Chuck would always call her Douglatoid Mutsky Hound, which is kind of something he used to say which would basically be dog, but in basically his own language called, that we used to call, that we call Chucklish. And I still remember some words that he used to stay, say, and I miss you a lot, Chuck. a little bit about how Pat and Chuck created a home that was very, very open to whoever needed a home to come to. And that included their friends, as you've heard about a little bit, and these 
excerpts, but also my friends, Noah and I's friends. You know, there were a lot of young people who didn't have the home vibe that we had. And when they would come here, they would just go, wow, I want that to be my home. And Pat and Chuck would go, well, come stay a while or come for dinner often or um, any number of wonderful things like that. And so I just wanted to say how much an integral part of that Chuck was in that he knew when to go and, you know, leave us to our own devices and when to join in and hang out with us and partake. Um, and everybody loved that about him. Um, and just the number of people who were here and who experienced that, it's a, it's a great list. Hi, um, I'm Patricia Finnegan, and I first met Chuck and Pat in 1984 when they enrolled then three and a half year old Noah in my little bear school, which at the time was a small group of kids in my home in the inner sunset. Um, so we became, we became friends and um, there were lots of play dates between Noah and my son Gabriel and later on between Shannon and my son Milo and my daughter Jordan. Um, eventually, we became, all became second family to each other. Um, we celebrated Thanksgivings and Christmases together and um, uh, they would come to my house on Christmas morning um, and after their kids had opened their presents at their house and all the kids would just play with all their new toys and the grown-ups would sit around and drink, eat the yummy food and drink wine and chat with each other until eventually they would leave to go to the airport to pick up Art. And, um, this was almost every Christmas of my kids' childhood. Um, uh, Chuck and Pat's home was second home to my kids, home away from home. Um, and I remember this one anecdote when um, a couple of my kids came home after being there. This is when they were all adolescents, and um, I guess Chuck and Pat hadn't been home, and Noah had some newish friends who didn't know them, and they were making sort of typical adolescent remarks about about the people that you know owned the house, about the you know their stuff, and um, you know what they would think, you know, and how they were so adolescently rebellious, you know, and my kids told me that they didn't say anything, but they were thinking, um, like, what are you even talking about? This is Chuck and Pat. They're like the coolest grown-ups ever. Anyway, that was a story that I remembered to illustrate that point. <laughs> okay. I can't think of a time that I saw Chuck that he wasn't just a ray of sunshine. Um, he was so warm and wonderful and welcoming. Um, I miss him a lot and I think about him often. I love Chuck very much and I miss him. And I think I realized at too late of a date that he was one of the men in my life who showed me what type of father and a husband I wanted to be. I love him. I miss him. And we love you. Love you guys. I asked Patricia's daughter, Jordan, to write a haiku for Chuck. Here's what she came up with. A free violin? You rolled your eyes and chuckled. No cost for Jordy's. Michelle Morris is another person who Chuck met when he first arrived in San Francisco in 1975. She became like a sister to him, as well as an integral member of our family. She often lived with us in between her wondrous adventures in nature. When Shannon moved to Maui in her late teens, Michelle was her protective auntie. Chuck and I, as well as her friend Pam and our pup Jessica, walked with Michelle through her last months of life, through many surgeries, chemotherapy, hospitalizations, and finally to Zen Hospice. One beautiful example of the home created by Chuck and Pat was the inclusion of his father's sister, Aunt Jessie Yingling. In the late 1970s, 
Most Sundays, Chuck would call his almost 80-year-old aunt who lived in Denver for a nice chat. One day, he said, you should come visit us someday. To which she replied, I think I'll do that. Lo and behold, the following week, the phone rang and it was Aunt Jessie at the train station along with all of her belongings come to stay. Pat gave up her room and the heat went up to 80 for the six foot tall, 90 pound, wonderful woman. Her life's work had been to play the organ for the silent movies until the talkies put her out of a job. She entertained at many a party, even accompanying a professionally made film with the sound turned off. Chuck was the only offspring from his father's family, so he was doted upon by his aunt. After Noah was born, Aunt Jessie, who was then working as a companion to an older woman, would call the house at least five to six times a day. She would say, is Noah home? And sing to him. It was lovely. Then, thanks to Ancestry.com, a new to us family member popped up. Unbeknownst to anyone living, a child had been born to 20-year-old Jessie. She was adopted by a loving family and produced two children. Chuck and Ellie drove to a downtown hotel when his new first cousin, once removed, was to receive an award. Ellie said, Papa, there is someone who looks just like you. Marsha Lynn Dittler, a gifted art teacher, world traveler, and now a part of our extended family. Hi, Marcia. Chuck's family and friends were very important to him. <coughs> Many of them had things to say that you would like to hear. <coughs> Enjoy. <coughs> Hi, I'm Deborah Rennie, but some of you knew me as Debbie Peltzman. I met Chuck and Pat in the early 70s, and for over 25 years, I had dinner at their house on Tuesday nights. In 2000, my husband and I moved to Oregon, and for the next 20 years, I would come and stay with Chuck and Pat three or four times a year, often for a week or more. I wanted to be a good house guest, so one time I asked Chuck, is there anything I do that you don't like? Or is there anything that I don't do that you wish I did? He thought hard about it, which made me a little nervous. And then he said, well, there is one thing. You don't come often enough. That was one of the nicest things that anybody ever said to me. And it really made me feel like one of the family. I told Chuck that if I were to count my friends on one hand, both he and Pat would be there. To that, he replied, I want to be the middle finger. Chuck, I want you to know that wherever you are, I have always loved you, and I always will love you. You're a Debster. I also wanted to talk about what a wonderful friend Chuck was. Um, being my dad, you know, he had a role, but almost beyond that role, he was just such a good friend. We spent so many hours sitting and talking and he was the kind of friend where it was every conversation was so deep and meaningful and um, and he just loved me so well um, without judgment and we had a lot in common, you know, so our talks were always very... Um, playful as well as deep and wonderful and I just got so much out of my relationship with him um, which is why the loss is just so huge because um, in life we don't have that many people like that you know that genuinely love us and connect well with us and you know, are there, are really there. So, um, you know, I've, I've always lived in the same place as my parents for the most part. So, you know, we, we were very close, lots of access, lots of hangouts, lots of dinners, lots of adventures. Um, he was an incredible grandfather to my two daughters. And um, I just, I, uh, when he was dying, I couldn't, 
I didn't know what to say. You know, all I could come up with was, I'm going to miss you so much. And I love you so much. And I feel like I was supposed to have this, like, final, last, amazing, profound talk. Um, and then I realized that I had, that, you know, maybe, I don't know, less than a week before he died. He was in bed and, you know, we used to have these Thursday night cocktail nights. And... He couldn't come out to the living room for cocktail night. And, I, you know, that was sort of my first indicator that something was really changing. And the whole family was there. So they were all just pulled to be out in the living room having fun. But I just couldn't leave his side. And so we sat and probably talked for over an hour about, I, can't, I wish I could remember what, but we must have talked about 50 different things wonderfully amazing topics and just staring into each other's eyes and laughing and crying and of course we had been you know we just lost Noah so there was a lot of a lot of sadness um in our home um but I you know I realized that 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 was my my last big wonderful connection talk with him and um maybe someday I'll remember what we talked about but I'll always know that that was there and that that was, you know, that that was really special. Charles Daly Gingling, you were more than just a father-in-law to me. You gave me my first lesson on tabla and every time I practice, I think about you. You're an inspiration then and ever since. Your memory will be a blessing. Hi everyone, I'm Silvia and I'm in Austria currently. One of the fondest memories I have of Chuck is meeting him for the first time. A meeting that most surely defined the path of my life. At the time, I was about 20 years old and I stayed at the Tibetan Buddhist Center on, I think it was Fell Street, and um, wanted to leave that place. And I was talking to Tundrop, who is a friend of Chuck's, about leaving the center. When Chuck came by and saw his friend, they chatted and Chuck said, our nanny, Sylvia from Austria, left two weeks ago. How would you like to come live with us and be our new nanny? The next day, Chuck picked me up in his white convertible Alfa Romeo and I became part of the most awesome family. So, so wonderful to be part of them. It turned out that the other Sylvia's hometown is very close to mine, which made us smile. I cannot and wouldn't ever want to imagine my life without my San Francisco family. Impossible. Chuck, when I think of you, I think of Grateful Dead music, your tie-dye t-shirts, single malt scotches, sailing, and espressos in the morning. I think of you and Pat sitting on the sofa, talking about your day's work, your jazzy singing in the mornings, when you got ready to leave for work, I think of your kindness and your big, big heart, your brilliance and all the good you did in the world. <sighs> I'm sure you and Noah are hanging out together. You both might even be listening in with a big smile on your faces. I send my love to you both. Hey everyone, I'm Chuck's nephew, Ray, and just wanted to share some memories I have of Chuck. Uh, something special that he did that I never really appreciated until later in my life, but it's something he did. And I noticed it when I was very young and it might happen while we were out in the golf course or on the beach or sitting down to a nice dinner, or maybe even 
going through traffic, going down 19th Avenue. But Chuck would stop and close his eyes and take a deep breath and just lean back and just soak it in. And I didn't understand it at the time. Sometimes it even scared me. <laughs> but as I got older, I realized that was Chuck taking a mental picture of a moment that was very special to him. And it was him being present and it was him just enjoying the moment. And I, I feel very blessed to have been present during many of those moments when we were doing any number of things. But um, so still to this day, I'll, I like to stop, close my eyes and take a deep breath and just soak in moments and think of Chuck. I miss you, Chuck. Hi, I'm Linda, an old friend of Chuck's. And I wanna tell you about him from my perspective. He was bigger than life in every way, deeper than the deep blue sea, and, and wider than some of the biggest vistas I've ever seen. Chuck lived life pedal to the metal. And if you ever rode in the back seat of his Mini, which we did several times, it, it was not for the faint of heart to be there. Shortly after Chuck died, Pat asked me if I would help her move part of Chuck's personal library that was in his office. And I had an unexpected surprise. I had an opportunity to see something I didn't know about Chuck. It was the depth of magnet, the magnitude of depth that he delved into everything, not just his professional work, but anything that piqued his curiosity, and he had lots of curiosity. It could be art, music, it could be philosophy, it could be religion, you name it. There were so many subjects that Chuck was deeply interested in and was happy to talk to you about if you had an interest in the same thing. He would take it to the max and had really researched it all. I did not know how, how completely he researched it. Chuck used that gift of his to connect with people. He, he deeply connected and we had a very large family, which all, they all knew Chuck well, even my father. And Chuck had a personal relationship with every single member of our family unique. I can't say we have any other friends that have been that expansive. And each one of our kids and my father, he met in different places. He met them where there was a common interest. He would figure it out or they would figure it out and off they went. It was quite amazing. Whatever Chuck lacked in social graces, he made up for it with his big heart. I had a very personal experience with him when I was um, diagnosed with lymphoma and was having a biopsy right by my parotid nerve. And my doctor explained that one of the possibilities, unlikely as it was, was some partial facial paralysis from the surgery. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, no problem, I'll have Chuck there. And I asked her permission, telling her who he was. And she said, he would be welcome, but this is not necessary. She said, we have been trained and we have all the equipment and you'll be fine. And I said, I'd like him there. And she said, just let me know what he says. And of course he was there. And what I didn't expect was in addition to all the technical knowledge that I knew he brought with him, I did not expect the emotional support. That hand that was on my shoulder as a last memory as I was going under, and that just sparkling face, his eyes twinkling and his smile huge, standing right above me when I woke up in recovery, holding my hand and leaning down in my ear and whispering, you're gonna be fine. Everything went really well. You're gonna be just fine. And then he let off 
that signature sigh of contentment, that little chuckle that he would give that was deep from his belly, that was signaling his happiness, his contentment, his, his pleasure in whatever. I've heard it all kinds of other times when it's been wine or food or music, but I didn't ever have that kind of experience. It was astounding. Thank you, Pat, for bringing him into our lives. Hi, everyone. My name is Holly, and I just wanted to create this video um, to um, pay respect to Chuck and his family and um, still wrapping my mind around the loss of him um, but just wanted to um, say that you know Chuck was like a dad to me um, he really showed um, what unconditional love was he was so funny he always told these stories that made me crack up um, and these weird voices that I loved um, so much. I would beg him to tell the story over and over again because he just made me laugh hysterically and um, I loved him for that. Hi, my name is Perry Irvine. I had the privilege of knowing Chuck for almost 38 years. He was amongst the most multifaceted people that I have ever encountered. His trailblazing work in neuromonitoring now aids thousands of people every day as worldwide interoperative, interoperative monitoring is done by people trained by Chuck. This work will be part of his lasting legacy, the product of his brilliant and innovative mind. But for me, Chuck also leaves many delightful memories, some of which I mentioned now. A few years ago, I told Chuck about the book, The Hundred-Year-Old Man Who Climbed Out the Window and Disappeared, Within a day, Chuck called me saying that he was laughing so hard that tears were flowing. Many, year, many years earlier, Pat and Chuck and their family regularly came to our home for Christmas afternoon. After a wonderful dinner, we would predictably look behind the couch and there would be Chuck snoozing away on the floor. Among Chuck's many passions was his love of fine wine. Opening a great bottle inevitably led to an expression by Chuck of the beauty of the wine in all its manifestations. His descriptions and facial expressions were worthy of a Broadway actor, another part of his wide-ranging life. However, for me, his last day is the most memorable. We were called to the hospital to say goodbye. As we drove there, I was dreading what I was about to experience. However, as we entered the room to find Chuck sitting in bed with a big smile, surrounded by his loving family and friends, I greeted him with, we have so much wine left to drink. His incredibly upbeat personality banished my dread. He was as alive and upbeat as he ever had been. He lifted our spirits as we said goodbye. He knew how to live and how to die. What a blessing. You've had that marvelous opportunity of experiencing Chuck for all those years. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Dalrymple. I'm Chuck's son-in-law and this is Ellie, uh, Chuck's granddaughter. I guess I just wanted to tell a story of how I met Chuck. Um, in 1995, I moved up from um, Arizona to, to the Bay Area, and more specifically in Sausalito. I was going to live on a boat with my uncle, my brother, and, and my cousin. Um, so that was the, the plan. It didn't work out, and I ended up moving back into the city. Um, and yeah, that's where I spent a good chunk of my time. And then I went into a dessert cafe called Toy Boat. Um, and sandwiches and then we uh i that's where i met shannon um shannon wanted me to meet her dad and so i was really nervous uh and we we met and i saw him and i saw chuck he was immediately a super happy jolly guy um we, we hit it off right away 
And then we started talking about boats because he said he had a boat. And then when he told me that he had a boat in Pelican Harbor, Annalena, we're on her now. And uh, I was I was just like, yeah, I have an uncle that lives there too. And it turns out that my uncle was Chuck's next door neighbor right here. So worlds, of, worlds apart and basically he was so close. He was right there. He was a great guy. I miss him dearly. He had his he had his own his own way with words that um, what did we call it? Chucklish. We called it Chucklish because he has just the way of what Chuck English. Chuck English. Um, Where he used to say bulk and stutter. Yeah, he used to play with language a lot. He loved dad jokes and plays on words. Um, so I'm gonna miss him a lot. And here's to you, Chuck. Bye. Hello everyone, I'm Arden, Chuck's oldest daughter, and I've been asked to tell you a little bit about their wedding. Chuck and Pat were married on July 13th, 1980, on a very foggy day on the side of Mount Tam. Some of you were there that day, and I was there too. Chuck and Pat had asked me to write and read part of their marriage ceremony. Way before the era of everyone getting ordained on the internet, I got to marry my dad and my stepmom when I was only eight years old. I remember being excited to have such a big special job. One of the things I loved most about being around Chuck and Pat when I was a kid is that so many other people were around too. There was always a friend or a whole group of friends coming and going, and it was so fun to be around a big, connected, interesting group of people who were family, whether or not they were related by blood. I think that's what I had in mind when I wrote this piece for their wedding. A man and a woman stand on a hill. Everything is still, but joy flows so strongly between them that one could reach out and touch it. And then in one burst of happiness, they join themselves together in one strong bond of love. That is how they feel about it. They are happy together and have joined themselves into one so that they may share their dreams and sorrows together. I think that Chuck and Pat are a special kind of people. Other people may think that only their mother or father or brother or sister are their family. But Chuck and Pat's friends are their family too. And that's why we're here. We're here so we can share our joy with our friends too. And that's what's important. Birds fly in flocks and flowers grow in groups. And Chuck and Pat are together to love and care for each other. Chuck and Pat's wedding was such a happy day. And it was an honor to be part of it. Hello, my name is Gail, and I'm a long-term friend of Pat and of Chuck's too. For openers, I'd like to say describing Chuck as unique is a huge understatement. How many people do you know who possess an encyclopedic understanding of the human brain with all of its anatomical structures as well as its functional physiology? How many people do you know who are avid drummers as well as very talented masters of the flute? How many people do you know who are brilliant scientists and are also members of the Actor, Actors Equity Fund? If I still haven't impressed you, how many people do you know who own wild spider monkeys as pets while living in a tiny New York City apartment? I think it's safe to say Chuck nailed Unique. Pat asked me to share a funny story, a memory about Chuck. Mine is a silly one, probably, probably reflects more on me than on him, but so be it. I met Chuck in 1978 at UCSF while working as his research assistant. He and doctors Heron and Gallen had been recently awarded a very impressive multi-year grant to study evoked potentials in 10-year-old boys with dyslexia. My role was to meet and greet the boys, AKA subjects, and cajole them into prolonged periods of sitting while I attached 12 electrodes to their scalp. This was followed by more sitting, but this time with headphones on and positioned in front of a screen that was flashing while I monitored their brain waves and their evoked potentials. Handling the kids was the easy part. 
The real brains of the operation was the behind the scenes electrophysiology workshop where Chuck, where Chuck worked. He reigned supreme. As a matter of fact, this was probably Chuck's idea of paradise. Technical difficulties or problems occurred periodically and were just part and parcel of running the subjects. When problems arose, I would alert Chuck and then dutifully follow him into this disarray of his workshop. In retrospect, I realized that this workshop bore a striking resemblance to Doc's workshop or laboratory in Back to the Future. And as a matter of fact, when I started thinking more about it, there were parts of Doc's quirky personality that also, oh, never mind, I, I digress. I would follow Chuck into the workshop and watch as he would go into super focus mode and troubleshoot the root cause of our current problem. Surrounded by the sounds of oscilloscopes, the smell of the solder gun, and the sight of twisted random wires, Chuck would start mumbling. Da 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 over and over again. Now, there may have been other lyrics, but frankly, I don't remember them at this point. It made a deep impression on me, however, because, well, I thought his mumbling was somewhat, somewhat unusual. Several years later, Pat, who also worked in the lab and ended up marrying Chuck, invited me over to their house for dinner. By then, Pat and Chuck had become good friends, and I knew that whatever we would be having for dinner, it would be delicious. Upon arrival, I was handed a glass of wonderful wine, probably French, before settling in to, into the living room for some conversations. As I sipped my wine, I started to pay attention to the background sitar music that was quietly slipping into my ear. Slowly, I began to recognize Ta da keter, ta ta ta, ta da keter, ta da keter, ta da ta da keter, ta ta ta. Oh my God! Had Chuck been actually singing all those years in the lab? I burst out laughing, and and exclaimed, "What kind of music is this?" They politely educated me about their favorite sitar musician Ravi Shankar, and his wonderful recordings. In fact, Chuck had been studying the tabla for quite some time. And so after all those years, I had just assumed that his tada tada keter was just part of his unique style. Chuck was a boss. He hated when I called him that. He was a mentor. He was a fellow wine club member. And he was a very long time friend, good friend to me. Rather than just unique, I prefer to think of Chuck as curious. As a matter of fact, he's one of the most curious people I've ever met. And by that, I mean someone who is perpetually learning new things, asking intriguing questions, and pursuing the endlessly interesting questions of how our brains work. He will be greatly missed, he is greatly missed by his friends, his colleagues, and of course, his family. And I feel very fortunate to count myself among them. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patricia Finnegan. And the thing that I want to talk about the most about Chuck is how essential he was to me when our Milo was 15 and went into congestive heart failure and was taken by ambulance to Stanford Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. Um, the thing about having a child who's seriously ill is there's a limited amount of information that you can hear from their physicians that's bad news. Um, maybe you could take in one sentence, maybe two, um, and, and then it's like comprehension st stops and you can't even get what they're saying, even though it's so essential. In those t days, those first couple weeks, we're touch and go and um, we didn't know day to day if he was going to make it. So enter Chuck with his superpowers. And um, he was able to explain things to me in, in language I could understand. Seriously, every parent of a seriously ill child needs a Chuck by their side. 
Um, he, he wasn't in a hurry to go rush off like the doctors were. He was there, he, no, no time pressure, and he would just explain things and let me take as long as I needed to understand what he was trying to say. He had, um, obviously, um, it, um, he was one of the most knowledgeable people on the brain that I've ever met, but also he, um, during, at this time, point in time, he had had heart surgery himself of about a year previous to this. And in typical Chuck fashion, had approached this experience by getting a giant book called The Heart and um, memorizing it. So he was like a walking encyclopedia on how the heart works and understood exactly what it was that was wrong with Milo and why, what all the things that were happening, why they were happening. So. Um, to add to his superpowers, um, there was a brief window of time when UC Med, the medical center where Chuck was on staff, and Stanford, um, where PQ, where Milo was, where they merged. And so Chuck had a badge, his name tag, that had the name of both institutions on it. So he didn't have to wait for the rounds, the morning rounds, um, to have the doctors tell us what was happening, and um, he, any time he could, he had access to their schedule, and any time there was a meeting planned, uh, what they were they gonna they were gonna discuss Milo, Chuck was in that meeting asking questions and and getting all the information, and then he could come back and 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 tell me and let me know. So um, anyway, that's it. <laughs> I want to speak on Noah's behalf. Um, this has been really difficult for me to try to come up with what to say, uh, in part because my brother is so incomprehensibly gone, and in part because I'm not really sure what he would say. Um, I uh, reached out to several of his friends to see if they would help me, so I'll I'll be speaking for some of them, and there's some videos as well. But um, Noah and I frequently talked about how much we dreaded the loss of our father and how much we cared about him and how scary and hard that would be. So Noah doesn't have to experience that. Um, and if he were here, it, it might be easier. Growing up down the street from Noah, I got to be very close with his family, which was punctuated by how different their family was from my own. I came to think of Chuck and Pat as my liberal parents. My own parents were conservative evangelical Republicans. We were homeschooled. Chuck's open-mindedness by comparison was a breath of fresh air. He had an easygoing attitude, seemingly about everything, but definitely about parenting. Chuck was one of the most playful adults I knew as a kid and was prone to loud outbursts of laughter. You all know what I'm talking about. He just seemed to think life was fun. Noah was also a free thinker. He would have been a handful to parent as a young teen when we were closest. But while my parents valued obedience over everything else, Chuck was happy to see Noah experiment with his world. It was as if he could see the world afresh through Noah's eyes and it was wonderful. Once when we were about 13, Chuck took Noah and I to play golf at Lincoln Park. It was my first time, and Noah and I were both frustrated. Rather than getting down, though, they both got silly. There's one hole I remember that's short enough to hit the green off the tee. So we all teed off, and Noah and I jogged down to the green. As Chuck walked up behind, Noah shouted, Chuck, you got a hole in one! What? No way! He did a little dance and hustled down to the green all happy, where Noah revealed that he had lied. The ball was sitting right there a few feet from the hole. Chuck burst into laughter. Ah, that was a good one. You really had me going, you asshole. We all laughed and took the rest of the day a little lighter. In fact, I've taken the rest of my life a little lighter for the joyful influence Chuck had on me. Hello, my name is Dave. I'm going to share a little memory that I wrote. Chuck and Noah were so close 
Their interactions often reminded me of two brothers. Noah adored Chuck and regarded him as a friend, a counselor, and a teacher. Chuck was obviously very wise, and Noah was constantly telling me of the things that his father had accomplished or had taught him to do. They were regular golf partners, and Noah was always excited to be going golfing with Chuck. They were often accompanied by one or more of Noah's friends, all of whom were fond of Chuck, with his easygoing attitude and hysterically dry wit. Chuck had a sense of humor that could at times be goofy and childish, or could be cuttingly sarcastic and so slick that sometimes it took a moment before you'd catch the joke. Noah really enjoyed Chuck's intelligence and his sense of humor, and these traits were clearly passed down from father to son, as Noah's quick wit and smart jokes were constantly on point. Spending time with the two of them could result in deep conversations about abstract and existential topics or crude and silly slaps fueled by Jameson shots and beer bags. Yingling beer, if possible. Through Noah, Chuck and I became friends, and he began challenging me to games on the phone app Words With Friends. Chuck was an immensely formidable player, and I had a hell of a time trying to beat him on this app that is essentially a game of Scrabble. Chuck would play words I'd never heard before, and I'd have to do a Google search to find the meaning, oftentimes marveling at his crazy knowledge of random words. He once remarked that I was his toughest opponent and the only one that had ever beat him although those wins were few and far between. I missed those games with Chuck, where he'd sometimes play a word and then leave me a message, using it in a sentence, often in a joke, which always made me laugh out loud. Like I said, Noah was like a brother to me, the closest friend that I had. And through him, Chuck became a father figure to me as well. <clears throat> I know that the loss of Noah was so painful for Chuck and losing them both in such a short time has been so hard for all of his family and friends. I take a small amount of solace in knowing that they are together and no doubt entertaining each other with continuous humor and love while together watching over us all with the same protective care that they were both so good at providing. It will be forever in our hearts. Thank you. Here's what Noah's girlfriend, Noah Olson, had to say about Chuck and Noah's relationship. I think Noah got a sense of adventure and goofiness from Chuck. Chuck was always so proud of Noah. They probably encouraged each other so very much. Chuck and I, what a hard story to contemplate with him not here. I'm still in shock. As with so many things like dissertations or having babies, he would have been here to hold my hand, problem solve, cheer me on. Our kids were forever wondering how it was that we got together and stayed together when we were such differently wired people. This cartoon says it all. I probably don't have to spell out those differences to all of you who knew us, but we did come from different molds and we truly loved and appreciated one another. We only concentrated on how different we were. We were having a fight. When we first got together, I made the mistake and warned him that I would believe that I would always be right. He never let me forget that, but it worked anyway. Every morning, we look forward to sharing what we called coffee tea. Even in that, we were different. <clears throat> it was a time to quietly discuss our dreams from the night and to talk about the things that we'd been too tired to go over or go deeply into the night before. For years, we went over and over the typical problems we were having in raising two challenging, ever-present kids and one kid who lived far away. In the evenings, we look forward to carefully selected, selecting a glass of wine, appreciating our intense lives, and feeling so very fortunate. One job that Chuck took on in the marriage was keeping me informed. I never liked reading the news because it seemed so biased toward everything negative. So he would avidly read 
and then share with me the important things that I needed to know to be an informed citizen it was a big job and he loved it. We had thousands of deep conversations about feelings, friends, music, books. I don't think that a glass of wine will ever taste the same. Each of us was also enriched by our travels together. Chuck was ever the world traveler and I got to come along. <clears throat> More than a dozen trips to Paris and throughout America and much of Europe. We also rented river barges and traveled the canals of the south of France, going five miles an hour or less, stopping whenever we saw a distant church, a winery, or a farmer's market. If we saw an interesting little restaurant, we would make a reservation and keep on going for the day. Then we would get on our bicycles and ride back for dinner along the trails worn by the side of the canal by the horses that pulled the barges in ages past. The last and best trip we shared was a month-long musical tour of Greece led by Dory Stein of Tangents Radio. It was for a small group of like-minded, intellectual, musically-oriented people. Remarkably, Dory arranged for us to cover most of the country and islands with private concerts given throughout. Chuck took all three children on many trips throughout the world as well. Too much to tell here. It was rich. Shannon points out that she was always moved by how deeply in love Chuck was with me. He thought me the most beautiful woman in the world, as well as the best cook he knew, an excellent mother, and a wisdom-filled psychologist. I would see him staring at me with a look that said, how was I lucky enough to marry you? A last gift came as I was looking for a list of computer passcodes that I knew would be somewhere. It was entitled, Two Pat Lund, re, when I die, date to be determined. Number one, always know that I've loved you more deeply and profoundly than I ever knew I had the capacity for, and that I have never wavered in my belief that you are the best thing that ever happened in my life. Grandkids are a close second. Number two, the IRA account number is Number three, see number one above. Number four, on the computer, the master code is number five, see number one above. Ending in, thank you for loving me so much, Chuck. Pretty nice final gift. And I'm having to shut off this recording as I read it to you until my voice clears. Hello everyone. Hello Pat, Shannon, and the extended Lund and Yingling families. My name is Feroz Tarafor, and I'm a neurosurgeon at UCSF. Most of you don't know me, but I had the pleasure of getting to know Chuck over more than 15 years as we tackled some complicated cases together. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words about Chuck and how much our friendship meant to me. I spent many long hours in the OR doing complex cases and discussing classical music with Chuck. He was a true Renaissance man, and I treasured his company as much as I valued and relied on his expertise. For many, his legacy lives on in hundreds, no, in thousands of patients with preserved neurological function. For me, his great gift was his love of all things interesting and beautiful. Not only do I think of him every time I do a case, but I smile every time I hear the opening chords of the Walstein Sonata or the brilliant arpeggios of the C major Bach prelude. Pat, I wanted to convey my sincerest thanks for sharing with me the Bach book from Chuck's library. It is so special and meaningful for me to have it to remember him by. I can only imagine how keenly his loss is felt by you and your family. I hope that the passage of time brings you some measure of peace after his sudden passing. I know what a dedicated family man he was. He often spoke of you and your kids and grandkids with such affection. I will miss him greatly, and I appreciate your giving me this precious book by which to remember him. My deepest condolences to all of you 
Chuck Yingling was a great man with a great mind and an even greater heart, and he will be dearly missed. When I was younger, I used to think about what it would be like to talk at my dad's memorial and what I would say, and it was always really upsetting um, because I knew the day would come, and of course, I dreaded it. Um, and now that the day is here, it's really hard to come up with what I want to say. And um, the man was just so big and so wonderful, and the loss is so big and so awful. Um, so I find myself stuck without words, but I'll try. <laughs> um, I used to come up with when I was younger was that I was always so impressed with how incredibly intelligent Chuck was and how he was so accepting of everybody and never looked down on someone for not being able to access the type of things he could access and he was just such a kind teacher that way you know here that's okay you don't know about this I'll show you I'll teach you you can learn and if you can't learn that's okay then I'll teach you something else and um you just was so so into learning and sharing and um it really translated beautifully um so just just that that he didn't have any arrogance there even though he you know he could have because he was a billion times smarter than anybody I ever knew. Um, Chuck hadn't planned on leaving. He'd promised to dance at Gita's wedding someday. He was cutting back on work to do some of his bucket list travel. He was getting new knees because the golf tournaments were calling to him. Yes, much sadness with his dear son gone. But Sailing with Phil and friends was on his list of to-dos, and he was getting such deep joy from sitting on the back of his boat, staring out over the water to Mount Tam, learning new pieces on the piano. We still can't believe that a person filled with so much life can be gone. Perhaps he wasn't too sad about leaving because he was going to be where Noah had gone. Ram Das told us not to be afraid that death was perfectly safe. May that be so. Thank you to each of you for being here, for treasuring Chuck, for keeping his memory in your hearts. Yeah.
where all the pages are my days, and all my lives grow old. When I had no wings to to warm my food up for me. And these ladies serve it to me cold from the refrigerator. I miss you, Chuck. I will always love you, Chuck, no matter what happens. And I just wanted to say that I really miss you and that I am hanging in my bed with your favorite pillow. Love you. I will always love you, Grandpa Chuck. I'm wearing your shirt. To remember you by. Love you. Hi, Chucky. We were going to say goodbye here at the end, and we decided we couldn't say goodbye. We actually decided we don't want to say goodbye. Yeah. So, hi, sweetie. Hope you're well. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. I am, my name is Rose, um, even though my uh, title card, I'm the Zoom master, obviously we're having a few <laughs> technical difficulties. Anyone, can everyone hear me now? All right, great. Um, I'm the Zoom master today um, and uh, Chuck was a very dear, um, unofficial member of our family. Uh, he was good friends with my Aunt Patricia and then my parents. We spent many holiday events at Pat and Chuck's house. Um, and uh, one of my favorite memories about him uh, is that when I was 11 to about 14, I wrote a 300 page novel, over 300 pages in Microsoft Word, which is the equivalent of like a 600 page actual novel. It was a total mess. Uh, and my own mother couldn't get through it, uh, but Chuck read the entire thing. He asked me to send it to him, and he spent about three months and read the whole thing and uh, sent me a long email about his thoughts and about how proud he was of me for finishing it. Um, and so that's something I will always cherish, um, but he was just such a beacon of love and uh connection and joy throughout my childhood and my adulthood, and he's he will be well missed. About Chuck's vast and, and immense accomplishments and love for everyone, which we all shared. I shared it as well. <clears throat> I do, though, like to tell you three very quick stories. One, uh, two about failures that Chuck had, and one about a world record that he and I hold. So the, the first failure is in the context of his loving of wine. He was in Los Altos to attend a shower for one of my daughter's weddings. I think it was Lauren's, but it might've been Kendra's, they'll correct me. Um, and he had a beautiful bottle of Heights Martha's Vineyards uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is my favorite wine and a very expensive bottle of wine. And I was very impressed that this was the wine he was bringing. And we were interacting at, on the driveway and he dropped the wine and it shattered right there in the driveway. So there is one bottle of wine that we won't ever taste because of one of Chuck's failures. Thank you, Chuck, for being there. And we'll never forget that. We always remember the immortal things that are 
or screwy. And of course, as he oh. said earlier, he would say there's plenty of blame to go around. So that's one failure. The second failure was actually a bunch of victories. I played golf with Chuck about six or seven times during his entry into that. And I've never been any good at golf. And we would go play the various courses around the Bay Area and he would beat me every time. And I would pay him the dollars I'd have to pay. It's a hobby of mine. So anyway, he, he ended up losing to me in golf, which was another one of his failures. And I was able to collect some of the money back. And the final one, this little quick world record, uh, we were, uh, as uh, no, uh, Shannon pointed out, their home was always open. And I often was uh, knock at the door at their home in Sacramento on Sacramento Street, as well as the one on Noriega. And I, he and I were sitting on the couch and we had an idea that was a conception in that moment to go to a movie. And from the conception of going to a movie to deciding which movie and actually sitting in the seat at the theater, it was seven minutes. So we decided right then that that was a world record and, is, and, I don't, and to my knowledge has never been, uh, never been beaten. So I'll end there and it's nice to see all you beautiful people that I know and love. Thank you, bye-bye. Um. Chuck was the only grandpa I ever knew. And it was very special that I wasn't really near him all the time. So it was very special when I was near him. And he would teach me a lot of really cool things, how to like engineer certain things. And he would sing along with me sometimes. So that was a really special thing. Aww. Um, I just want to tell a story because it's a good dad joke that he once told me. Uh, the first time I had met him, I was kind of obsessed with paradoxes and I was going off about different paradoxes and this and that. And he's like, well, you know, Shannon's parents are a paradox. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, we're, we're both doctors. We're a paradox. And I was like, ah, ah. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> it made me laugh. I'll always remember that. Thanks. Hey, I'm Marsha, the, the cousin. And um, the kind of, I knew there was family out there, but um, other people didn't. So my mother was adopted and would have been Chuck's um, first cousin. So I did Ancestry.com and some other things to see who was out there. And when I got a hit, finally, because I did have a last name, Yingling, to Chuck, I was really thrilled. And that's the story about going up to San Francisco. I was getting an award um, from the California Art Education Association, and I just hoped like you wouldn't believe that I would be able to connect and meet them. Ellie, do you want to tell what you said when you saw me coming out of the hotel? Um, I actually don't, I don't quite remember what I said. It was a I, long time ago. I think um, the story was something that you were in the, the mini and I was walking across from the hotel, the you're coming up to pick me up. And she said something to Chuck, like, Chuck, there's somebody who looks like you. And, um, and then I met Noah later that night. And at the gathering, somebody came up to Chuck and me and said, Chuck, is this your sister? And he turned to me and then back to him and said, no, this is my cousin. And I just met her today. I'm thrilled and sad not to have a little bit more time. It was about what, four years ago, I think that I found everybody or they found me both. But after he passed, I had a dream that he, everybody was in the house um, that they're in now. And he just came up, put his arm. I was the last one out and outside waiting to go in. And he just put his arm around me and basically said, come in your your family 
very tear jerking and beautiful. So thank you. I'm honored to meet family and family that are friends. So thank you. Hi, how are you? Well, my name is John Brody and you don't know who I am, but I think I can easily consider you all friends as you were friends with Chuck. Chuck and I were in many ways were like quantum particles apart by light years in many cases and seemingly always in touch. He was the first person who I could think of as being a mentor, but who I could also think of as being in synchronous with. And it's not something that we all get to experience. Little things that you can share with someone and that no, like making up words and calling golf flog <laughs> that happened differently, but are quantum like. I got to experience with Chuck wine, bits and pieces of his family, Pat, little snippets of conversations that became chuck in points because we were in different parts of the world and different places and but always important things um we met way back at rice where he was much further along in his uh approach to life than i was but that initial period of my life taught me many things. And luckily, it was a period of time when people were trying to become aware that you tried to look at a person and understand the person for who he or she was. And that's where I discovered that the quirkiness of Chuck was a wonderful thing. <laughs> that intelligence and being one of a kind and being wacky and being someone who has the ability to speak truth are great and important things. I love Chuck, always will. And yes, I too will never say goodbye. He's with me. Thanks for meeting you all. Thank you. Uh, Nina, you are next. Hi. It's been a while since I had seen Chuck before he passed, probably a couple years. Every once in a while, when he was at the Veterans Hospital, I would run into him or meet up with him. Um, but I wanted to share one just really quick memory of my first day on the job um, when I got into Chuck's little mini and we drove down to Redwood City Kaiser to monitor a case. Um, and he was so excited and telling me about everything we were going to learn and do. Uh, that he kind of failed to stop at a stop sign and got pulled over and got a ticket. Um, <laughs> and he handled it really well. And I think he was like ever so slightly embarrassed that in his first day with me in the car, he got a ticket. But, um, you know, we went with the flow and everything was fine. Um, and, and I had a really wonderful time working with him um, and our other colleagues for about four years from that point forward. Um, and I miss him too. Thank you for including me. Hi. Well, um, I wanted to uh, tell a story that there was a Rumi poem that all of us loved in the 1970s. And then I was looking for it today and I found one that we loved even more. So Chuck would love to hear this poem as well. 
late by myself in the boat of myself, no light and no land anywhere. Cloud cover thick, I try to stay just above the surface, yet I'm already under and living within the ocean. It feels like a fitting ending to this. Um, we did have one more who raised their hands. Did you want to close up here? Or yeah. <laughs> the barrier. Yes. Okay, Can you great. hear me? Can you hear me? I just want to say that I know that Pat and Shannon really agonized over preparing this um, video for us all. We've all talked about what a Renaissance man Chuck was and how many different facets there were to his life. And we all loved him deeply. And I think we, each of us learned something new about Chuck today. And <laughs> it's added to the richness of our uh, love of him. So thank you, Pat and Shannon for doing this. All right, Flora, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to extend a special thanks to Pat and Shannon too. I can't imagine how difficult it was to put this together, but it was absolutely beautiful and heartfelt and moving. And so it was nice to get to be together all together and, and share this. So thank you for that. And yeah, I've known Chuck and family my whole life. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to extend uh, love and well wishes to the, to the full family and friends. Hi, you guys. Um, I, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I'm a little emotional, but I just want to say thank you for doing this. This has been incredible. And it's just seeing all of you and your friends that were so formative for me growing up. I was at those parties and your wedding and, and it, I was a little kid running around and um, just your, just Chuck's and you, Pat, too, your whole friend group, which a lot of you spoke today and were on the video, just had such an openness and welcome vibe to, and just a different kind of um, approach to the world. I mean, you guys were hippies, right? And no. I loved that. I loved growing up amongst you, and I loved the smells wafting in from the porch, and you know, so um, <laughs> I love you guys, and it's really wonderful to see some of your faces that I haven't seen in so long. That's it. Mwah. Thank you. Uh, John, did you wanna go next? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello, my name is John Barron. Chuck was my friend. He was a great guy and he was a great sailor. We sailed on San Francisco Bay together. So in the sailor's tradition, I'm going to ring eight bells for Charles Yingling. The sailor is home from the sea. Rest in peace, Chuck. Thank you all very much. Hi everyone, um, I'm John Rom. I was a nurse that took care of Chuck uh, in the ICU when he was so sick. Um, getting to know him was really wonderful. And then meeting, of course, meeting your family was just so great. Um, kind of made me break my own personal rules of how close I get with patients in the ICU. But with uh, 
with all of you, how could I not? Um, I would sit with Chuck in the nights um, when he wasn't sleeping and he would tell me about his life and it just seemed incredible. Um, and every time the cardiologist would come and he would get bad news, that he was getting sicker, his heart was getting worse. Um, the bravery that he, he had and the, the look on his face, he was just not scared. And I remember when the cardiologist told him kind of, you might not leave. Um, and after he left, he and I sat together and he looked at me and he said, well, is this it? And it's really difficult to say. And I said, I think so. Yeah. And he just said, okay. And we sat there and I put my hand on his shoulder and we just sat in silence for a while. And um, he said, do you think I should call people? And I said, yeah, I think you should call every person that you, um, that you want to be here as soon as possible. Um, and he got two days of being with family and processing that and having all of these people there um, was really beautiful and really powerful. And I just, it was, it's so far the highlight of my career. It's why I became a nurse and I, I, uh, I'm so lucky to have had that experience with you all. Thank you. It's said that the Egyptians believe that people died twice, once when they took their last breath and once the last time someone said their name or the last time they were held in memory. I think from this gathering today, the Chuck will live for a very, very, very long time. Uh, it was wonderful to hear so many facets of his superb life and his family and his friends that I don't think his memory will fade. And I think Chuck will take a long time to truly die. Okay. Raise your hand. Thanks everybody for being here. And um, this has been just really cathartic and beautiful and watching everyone's faces has been my favorite part, you know, checking in when you're mentioned or when we're hoping you're laugh and people have been. And um, so thanks everybody. Thank you. Oh, we're there, but not there. Thank you. <laughs> Bye Lolo. We love you. See you tomorrow. Can't wait. You guys knocked it out of the park. You really did a good job. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Well done, you guys. Very and eventually, beautiful. eventually, you guys, we do want to have a in person. So please be on the lookout for for a big party to celebrate Noah and Chuck, and we'll do it upright. We'll we'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So are they in their house then? Was that? Yeah. Are they aware? It's right here. I mean, not there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right here. I don't know that you can. Thank you so much. So they're in Palo Alto. Love ya. Boomers on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pat and Shannon. You did an amazing, amazing job. I'm just touched beyond words. Thank you. I love you so much.